so uh, once again, I intentionally made the lecture up so that there's time for any questions at the start because we're moving forward on to higher order corrections. But are there any questions that people came up with thinking about what they saw for the first three lectures? No? No, if anything pops to mind as I start to go through the slides, feel free to interrupt. It's better for it to just be a discussion more than a rapid escalation of information. So let's go forward, but please do interrupt if you have any questions. So what I'm going to try and do, this is the last lecture that's like a lecture sort of approach, is try and build upon some things I've been telling you. And we have to basically address this question of going beyond leading orders. So what you saw in terms of dimension six interference effects with the standard model and the SMEP, those sorts of studies, those were hard enough to get going, but that's pretty under control now in a lot of ways. And yet there's very strong motivations to go further the dimension A and do loop corrections. And you might think that, that how could that be, right? I mean, <laughs> we haven't yet find giant deviations. How could it possibly be that we want to go beyond leading order to interpret the data correctly in the CFT? But that's actually pretty strongly motivated, as you'll see. I'll give you the motivation. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, actually, more than a little bit about the renormalization curve evolution of the theory of dimension six. Some people have been asking me about that a little bit. So that was a bit foundational for the loop program to start off. In 2013, we were normalized that, that aspect of the theory. And um, that's in and of itself interesting, but what's a little more interesting, actually, which is kind of remarkably interesting to my mind, is when we started to actually do full loop calculations, things like case to gamma gamma of one loop with dimension six operators, we found some unusual structure and it got a bit confusing as to what was showing up in the calculations. And that actually, for my experience historically, was one of the things that led to another clue for the geometric approach kind of being the right thing to do going forward. So I'll try and make that clear to you how that calculation worked and what was a bit weird about it that really bothered me that led us to basically rethink things and find this geometry. And then we'll talk about word identities in this map. Again, we'll relate this to field space geometry. Although the, the, the seminar tomorrow is going to be focused in terms of like a complete box in terms of this geosmet approach. I'm trying to basically saturate you with lots of clues as to how things have kind of emerged over the years leading up to the kind of coherent geosmetic approach, which is now in place. And then we'll talk a little bit about dimension key corrections. And, and I'll show you some formulas, which are kind of like the best formulas we can calculate now in this theory. That's basically the end plan. But it's a bit gentle. There's not that many slides today. So I'll give you lots of time for questions. Okay. So, not believe me. Uh, as to why we would want to basically take this theory beyond the leading order. So this is just from the other day, Nima was giving a talk at CERN on the Higgs at 10 festival, which I think was earlier this week. And he's saying something uh, correct, which is basically, this is an amazing particle we've discovered and we've never seen anything like it before. So obviously we want to put it under the best microscope that we can. We want to study this thing to death. And that's really kind of like a mantra of the field that's absolutely adopting. That's, uh, and, and I think it's hopefully obvious to you, but the SMAT, is really the microscope he's talking about. Right? I mean, this is a consistent field theory, and it's a microscope that can be kind of consistently improved over time. So we want to make a, as good a microscope as we can. So we want to study this, this particle to death. So how good a microscope do we need? So that's when it gets a bit complicated, but it actually is kind of beautiful that the complications, instead of making our lives terrible, have actually taught us something about field theory in terms of this geometric approach, which makes our lives much easier. So the next leading order, Calculational effects for a while were just terrifying, but really at the end of the day, they actually led to a beautiful simplification, as you'll see. So let's go and start calculating beyond leading order. So, why do we want to calculate beyond leading order? Well, it's essentially that the whole point of this exercise is that we believe there's some scale separation, right? We think, we hope that there's some heavy new physics in the interesting regions that consistently can be in the few TV sort of scales, and we can't see it quite directly experimentally. And we're going to make much much measurements down here uh, in terms of like collider uh, measurements at TEV scales and below and other low energy measurements we're making with enormous data sets and that will get very precise over time. And we want to essentially the whole point of this program is to basically find some Wilson coefficients at some lower energy scales dictated by experimental measurements and then learn about this heavy new physics. But when you actually generate these Wilson coefficients and matching. What happens when those Wilson coefficients are generated at the high scale is that they change as you go down to the low scale under the RG evolution of the theory. 
So this scale separation is kind of the you know basic idea of the EFP. And so beyond the leading order corrections we've been talking about in terms of amplitude perturbations, we talk a lot about basically dimension six corrections that come in with some coefficient. And I'll use this tilde notation here throughout this to kind of clean up the expressions. Tilde just means I've absorbed a v squared over lambda squared. So it's either dimension a, b to the fourth or lambda to the fourth, or v squared over lambda squared for dimension six, just to, just to know the notation. So we talked a lot about these sorts of calculations. SMEPSIM essentially can generate a lot, can generate this consistently for your flatter intervals. But because of this scale separation, we basically want this log, which basically comes about from the RG evolution, and we'll, we'll go into that in a little more detail. So we want this guy. So is that enough? Do we just need to get this plus this? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, as the case may be, that's not all we need. So if we look at this formula, there's a couple of problems which is saying, oh, just grab the log. So first of all, if you actually do the calculations, we'll go through the things together again, but you'll see it explicitly. You'll find that this numerically is not much bigger than this other term, which doesn't have a log, but also has to do with the loop corrections. Okay, so just practically, it's not a good approximation to just keep the log and not this. Even though the log has to do with how things are changing, going from the different scales, there's a full perturbative correction that's present. So we kind of need that. We need even more because many we're trying to cover as many cases as possible in the EFT. We don't want to do like pathological things where the Wilson coefficients differ by millions or something, but unless there's symmetries underlying that. But we do want to basically be a little agnostic and say, well, some of these Wilson coefficient hierarchies could be like a factor of five or ten or something. And if that was the case, then that makes these effects even more important because you can get things coming in at loop level that wasn't there at tree level. And that makes these calculations more important. It can also upset the hierarchy between these two things as well. So that's pretty straightforward. So we need this. We get that by simulation. And we also need this term. So we need this guy. So it's really not much longer than the log. If you look at the numbers, the log starts to dominate, practically speaking, in most of the calculations when you think about the cutoff scale being like 3, 4 TV and above. And essentially, at some point, when you put a high enough mass scales, the whole program is just not going to be able to pick up anything in terms of experiment because the effects will be too small. So we're living in that region where we're like TV, like few TV, where these log effects are important and the general perturbative corrections are important. But it's not the case, it's just complete log domination and everything's you know, small compared to the log. Just you know, look at the numbers and how it works out. So we have to do the calculations to make that statement actually known, but now that we've done this calculation, we know that's the case. Okay, so we got this. We need this, we need this. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, it's make a choice. It's also true that the dimension eight effects for many of the things we're measuring at those scales, dominated by standard model kinematics, scale like this, just in terms of the dimension full suppression, whereas these sort of perturbative corrections are what we're getting either for here or with the log enhancement. The log is much bigger, so this is basically the story. And it's frequently the case that this, in terms of corrections, is also bigger than this. So the dimension eight effects, in other words, if we actually find something, start to find deviations, are not going to make it so that we can interpret things at dimension six, but they're probably going to be a perturbation to what we see at dimension six, which is numerically a bit bigger than the perturbative corrections involving the dimension six operators. Just practically speaking, because the cutoff scale is not too high, and uh, essentially 16 high squared is kind of big in terms of this effect. So we need this too. Okay, if we need this, which is one of our lambda to the fourth for consistency, we also need this, which is not just the unique square term, but like the full cross terms that we get for dimension six. So we basically need all of that in terms of our theoretical predictions if we can produce it. That's the basic motivation. So what do we have? Okay, what practically can we do? What can we hit enter on in the code and just get? So SMEPSIM, which came out of the Copenhagen group, uh, basically was the response for the experimentalist need, needing a systematic, consistent code that could generate all these coefficients. And it does do that for you. It's a UFO model, you interface with MagGraph, and if you like to do such things, you can just hit enter and you can generate all sorts of simulation results. It has two input parameter schemes. I've been emphasizing the two input parameter schemes all the time are important to do and check things. And it has, it's not just one code, it's actually a whole set of codes. It has the full flavor symmetric version. It has the general flavor version, believe it or not. I had some very good postdocs that were very hard putting everything in with all the indices. And it even has, in this 
kind of modification of it, adding a couple of the flavor assumptions and a little more stuff, which is came out of uh, this sort of Larry Virgil from Postdoc of mine, who's now in Zurich. It also has these top symmetry assumptions. So it's got a whole suite of things just to generate all of those AIs consistently. And so that's pretty much a solved problem. So it does not generate the full set of these terms. It generates a subset of those terms when you square things up. So keep that in mind. But a subset of those terms can also come about through this kind of systematic, just running the code. Yeah. So you said uh, this is uh, fully automated. And yeah. then you have the earphone model. Mm -hmm. But the meta only has to one loop, right? That's right. So that means your ASM is uh, at, at the order of up to one loop, but then all the high order questions or EFT operators. So this is something where you basically take a standard model UFO model, and you can also basically hack in some of the standard model loop diagrams, which are really important in terms of like the generating things to gamma gamma and things to blue blue. Uh, but you can also just take other codes and basically rescale some of the standard model effects. So it, I really mean this coefficient is what can be generated, but then you have to kind of hack it and combine it with other best calculations in the standard model to get the full cross section effects for the standard model at the highest order that we currently have. So there is, there is some automation. Sorry? That, that part is procedure is done automatically. That's right. Okay. Yeah, you need to sometimes use other codes and that sort of thing to do that. That's right. Okay. And it and it's it, that's not perfect, right? It's limited, it generates a bunch of these, but not all. But nevertheless, it does a bunch of that work for us. So where are we now? So recently, in, in the recent years, people have been pushing towards dimension eight. This is a paper by Chris Murphy, who basically worked on the dimension eight basis, like the Warsaw basis. The GS map, which I'll talk a lot about tomorrow, and I've been sprinkling through these lectures. It's been developed in this series of papers, and it lets us do many dimension eight results. And I'll show you a complete one in a moment. And some specific processes, also just the brute force calculation, are known at dimension eight. This is work from people around Argon, Monolepon, uh, Martin, and uh, other such. So a bunch of dimension eight results are coming in the last couple of years because the basis is there, and people are pushing in this direction. We know we need to do it. Loops have been going on for many years, and I'm going to talk a lot about this calculation. I've been obsessed with things to gamma gamma for a long time. Uh, it costs a lot. But there was an earlier work I want to emphasize by these gentlemen who actually did, like, I think the first really consistent, complete one loop calculation in the SMEP with dimension six operators. So pretty, pretty cool work that they did. And then there's a whole series of things from a whole bunch of other groups that have been happening in the last couple of years. And none of that is like fully automated in like a completely coherent way where you can stay up here and get everything. But there is a code here which does a bunch of QCD stuff, but it's not completely the whole story. And it's uh, also the case that we also go to lower energies of loops, and also there's some very important work. Like some of that have the reference here, matching to lower orders, which I'll show you the DRG part of in a second. But that was a big business story. Sorry, just a kind of a literature bomb, but just so you can look at these slides later and follow it if you wish. Okay. So, so here's an important point, which people are still kind of adopting, which we basically really understood last year. So this, those different coefficients I was telling you about, motivating them to need all these different terms, they're not really all independent. And that's a bit strange when you first see that statement, but it's actually the case. Now, why is that? This is just the dimension six part that you just formulate and you have some in some particular formulation generating this sort of coefficient. You choose essentially how you define your leading order Lagrangian. The choice you make in defining your leading order Lagrangian basically dictates a set of perturbative corrections if you go to one loop and also dimension eight corrections in a correlated fashion. So whatever choice you make, a subset of the dimension eight stuff is correlated with some loop corrections having to do with input parameters and shift in defining the Lagrangian at leading order. And that means that those, these corrections are not all independent from one another. That's a bit maybe subtle, but it's actually kind of obvious when you think about it. So like think about a gauge coupling. You can choose to write down this term with a gauge coupling or not. Some people do these different normalizations. SMEFSIM has a normalization where it doesn't write down gauge couplings when there's field strengths around. That's choice. But whether you chose to keep it or not, in any case, you can kind of see if you did choose to keep it, it's kind of like kind of clear. This you then have to map to some number at leading order. And that mapping to that number at leading order has itself a perturbative expansion and a dimension eight expansion, just some input observable. So you can just kind of expand this out. You can see the higher order terms are being cross correlated with one another because of the choices you're making at leading order. It's kind of scheme dependency in this map construction. 
So it's just correlated. So we want to be careful that actually basically have all the terms be cross consistent in our formulation as well. If we separately calculate this, and some other group calculates this for a process and it's inconsistent with the leading order formulation, you might think, oh, we'll just rescale the leading order result and simple. No, it actually changes these two results. We want to do this consistently, cross consistently. Hopefully that's clear. So let me get back to the RG and talk about that a little bit. Okay. So as I was saying, we want to run right from the QTV region down to this low energy. And I don't know how familiar you are with normalization group evolution in terms of operators and higher dimensional operators, but this is basically the way I think about it. At the highest scale, you have some matching, which basically gives you some pattern of those components. Think about a two-dimensional case, right? So it gives you some direction, so some magnitude of some local coefficient, which will just have this red box, and some other magnitude, some other local coefficient. And then what happens is you basically evolve completely calculable within the EFT because it's just having to do with the standard model interactions and with the higher dimensional operators. You can basically calculate this coefficient from the divergences that are present in the theory. And this coefficient will be something like this. It'll be some loop vector and it'll be some off that. It doesn't have to be diagonal. It can be off diagonal. And an operator that you can write in one diagram with these sort of loops can actually rotate as you go down in scale to some other direction. So what happens when you go down in scale is essentially you measure things like this at the low scale. So one measurement, one experiment to get a linear combination of these, another measurement to get another linear combination of these, you start to figure out individually these sorts of things. But we were actually trying to understand is physics beyond the standard model, which is living up here. So you have to basically undo that. So you need to basically have the loop correction. That's what the RG does for you. But you can calculate it in closed form before any of the codes. You just do it analytically by hand, which is what we did in 2013. So it's not just that. We need a lot of information because we have like a significant number of Wilson coefficients. So this RG part was this work uh, that we did. But then there's another set of RG results, which has also been done by these, these collaborators. Uh, and they basically are running from when you integrate up things like the, the W and the top and things itself, and you go down to even the lower energy effective theory. You have to do that systematically and run that theory as well. Because a lot of measurements down here are going to be necessary in due time to combine up with the measurements that we're going to get see. So the, basically the divergent structure of the theories, the, multi, the set of EFTs is under control, and the guidance that provides for loop calculations is pretty much uh, is pretty much essential to basically do the loop program. So this does you do stuff like this. So I don't know if you can see this. So what this is is basically what you do is you can just analytically calculate in the EFT. So I told you that there's some underlying formal field theory results, like the, the, the divergent structures themselves, like you can do this local analytic approximation and the divergences don't come in arbitrary mathematical forms, but they have to, map, have to map to operators. So what you do is essentially you have some operator that you can write basically down some diagram and you basically calculate all the one loop diagrams involving that operator with the arbitrary external legs. And then basically generates a bunch of divergences. And you look at those divergences and you look at basically what it maps to in terms of operator forms. And you basically figure out the renormalization group, the, the counter term matrix you have to multiply the operators by to cancel off all those divergences. There's a lot of subtleties here. One of them is that you write down diagrams that essentially you might not think would be relevant to the particular scattering process you're doing. You write down all 1PI diagrams. And then sometimes you get divergences there. And those divergences, when you look at the structure of them in terms of an operator interpretation, they don't look like the operators you've chosen in your basis. So that's a bit confusing, but you just basically map those divergences back by the equations of motion to the operator basis you chose at tree level, and you get a closed form for the normalization group evolution of the theory. So you have to do all these sorts of diagrams with all the different possible operators, the 59 plus community contract operators, dimension six, you can deal with all the flavor indices, and it just it's, it's just a calculation you can just execute. But that, that was what was done to basically get the divergence structure under control. That's why I have some gray hair. Let's do that improvement. So here's something I'm going to talk about a lot, DC gamma gamma. So these sorts of diagrams, for example, are diagrams that give the vertices related to AC gamma gamma. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, not all diagrams are made equal. Some of the diagrams caused a lot of trouble, and some of this, a lot of the structure of the normalization group of the theory basically has to do with penguin diagrams like this. So why is this trouble? Essentially, you can have a four fermion operator, which there's a lot of them with a lot of indices. You can basically close this loop and emit a gauge field. This is a penguin diagram form. You can map to an operator form for this, which will have a derivative acting on the field strength and then two Fermi-up fields. But those are operators that in the Warsaw basis have been chosen to be removed. So you have to basically have to remove those by field redefinitions, map all those divergences back to what's remaining in the Warsaw basis, 
And that is a, a lot of what the answer actually is. So this tells you something. This tells you that four fermion operators are particularly challenging in terms of the divergences, in terms of loop corrections when you do them. Because their structure in terms of the EFT, which is a bit different than the standard model, and this sort of divergence structure is also present at higher orders in standard model calculations and at, and at low energy calculations that people have looked at in terms of meson mixing. But when you have automatic code, you have to be a bit careful with this sort of structure and basically getting your divergences correctly in codes is one of the things that next lean would automatically do corrections involving four Fermian operators. This is, this is a, something that's a bit different compared to the standard model case. But this is known analytically. That's part of it. Doesn't make part of the result loop there. Now, when I said map back by the equations of motion, what I mean is you just basically use these formulas. Okay. So remember the Higgs equation motion, gauge field equation motion, the derivative is acting on those are the Fermians. These Fermians are gauge fields and downstream Fermians up there. Um, so the derivative is acting on the Fermian fields and also the, the gauge field and equation motion themselves. So this is definition. And you use those with the divergence structures that you have to basically map back the structures that don't look like the operators you chose in your basis. You just systematically just linear your algebra map them all back. And you get closure. This is a test of the operator basis itself being well defined. And formally, what you're doing is this sort of thing. Basically, you're doing field grid definitions. And your field grid definitions are essentially up to one over lambda to the fourth effects. Things like this are being done. You're choosing coefficients to cancel off operators at leading order. You're then redoing this field redefinition involving the perturbative correction result that you have. And essentially, that basically is putting divergences in a combination of other operators. So, when you're using the equation of motion, it's also important to remember that the divergence you got, which might just live one particular form, will be mapped to generally a combination of the operators that you've chosen in your basis. So, this kind of tells you that your basis, when you start doing loop corrections, gets mixed up. You should have to be careful and keep all the operators to be sure that you're being consistent in terms of quantum mechanical corrections. This is really interesting as well that you can actually have the case coming out of these equation of motion effects. The equation of motion effects don't necessarily have direct diagram interpretation. So what you can have is you can have an operator and you can find that it mixes with another operator on a non redundant basis where you use the equations of motion. And you can try and write down the diagram directly that corresponds to the operator mixing to the other operator. You don't kind of write the diagram down. So it's only when you write down another diagram and use the equation of motion on that result that you actually get the mixing. So it's, it's a little non-intuitive in the sense of how Feynman diagrams work, but it's the equation of motion effects combined with Feynman diagrams that make this sort of thing happen. So it just tells you to be very careful, keep all the operators, calculate all the terms in the EFT. Hopefully that's clear. And by the way, this is just a very advanced modern version of something which is known back in 1979. They met this in flavor physics, this exact sort of issue. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of loop calculations using these divergences as a guide, basically, to do loop calculations. So here's, we talked about ZDK. So we worked on ZDK a little bit. Other groups have worked on it as well. But this is just uh, basically the result that I know from what I did. So what, what's a bit difficult as well when you start doing loop calculations or dimension eight calculations is that you basically have to think about doing loop calculations which correct the inputs and loop calculations which correct the outputs and you have to combine up both in an LSE to basically get the full answer. So it's a lot of work, essentially. So you have to get the input shifts and the decay shifts, both in one loop and dimension. So the diagrams like this appear for you doing that sort of procedure just for Z to K. These diagrams are color coded to be the ones that have to do with the direct modifications of one loop of Z to K. And this is just a part of the calculation. This is just a part of the calculation that has to do with lambda dependence, essentially. Because uh, that was something we do in the top part of the And these are things that have to do with changing the input parameters in the calculation in terms of how we're inferring the numerical values of gauge couplings and that sort of thing at one loop. Both of those exist, and you can just calculate them systematically. What's nice is that the divergence structure here, you can actually figure out a little bit what you, to ex what, what, what you expect in terms of diagrams you need to do. Because at tree level, you know essentially the counter term matrix. So you know the operators that appear at tree level in Z decay. You look at the counter term matrix and it says, well, it tells you it's going to introduce some other operator Wilson coefficient dependence. And you can say, well, that Wilson coefficient dependence has to come into this calculation on one loop. So how can I write a diagram involving that Wilson coefficient dependence that basically generates a one loop result? So it's kind of a guidance as well in terms of doing the calculation in the normalization group. At the end of the day, I don't want to go into the details of it. Uh, you can see the paper. The point is the following. This is just calculating one of those coefficients I told you about at the start. 
And you can introduce a lot of other operator dependence. So you have like a bunch of operators that appear at tree level, that appear in Z to K, not too many, but tens. But then you start doing these loop diagrams, and you get a whole bunch of other operators that don't appear at tree level, first appearing at one loop in a particular process. That has to do with mixing, it also has to do with finite terms that are there involving these other Wilson coefficients. It's just calculable, but it does tell you that you have to start to do a global SMAP program. And you have to be careful to basically do global studies where you have all these sort of rules of being basically a concern. And if you make the distinction between operators that lean order, you might say, oh, four fermion operators in my mind are very different than operators that are involved with CDK. As soon as you start doing loops, of course, that distinction fails. And you have to start basically starting to in a more global way as well. So we need to combine data sets for many reasons, getting rid of input parameter scheme dependence, just having a meaningful field for definition and varying conclusion from combinations of data sets. But also just because the loop calculations introduce a lot of Wilson coefficient dependence, mixing a bunch of things up and how it appears. So let me talk about Higgs to gamma gamma a lot. Okay, so let me just guide you through this calculation. So Higgs to gamma gamma is an obsession of mine. And let me just show you how this sort of calculation is done. So first we do the RG. So the RG proposes basically this counterterm matrix, and it's exactly this for the three operators that appear in Higgs to gamma gamma at tree level. Okay. So that kind of term matrix being there, you basically know essentially how you're going to induce a whole bunch of other operators of this form coming from the initial operators that are there at tree level. Okay, so all of these other guys are inducing, you know exactly that the divergence structure and therefore the logs come from a certain form. Because you know that you have the end, you basically have that calculable result in this term all DFT, just it's RG itself. So then by looking at this. Structure, you know that a guide as to how the loop calculation should appear. Okay. So it tells you diagrams like this should be the diagrams that are around. And indeed, you do the calculation, and that's, what, that's exactly what happens. These diagrams have divergences. You have the counter term matrix with those Wilson coefficients coming in at tree level, and you find exactly if you do the calculation correctly that those divergences all cancel out as expected, because that's what the RG is supposed to do. But then the log remains that's associated with the divergence in the one loop calculation. The gauge dependence cancels, gauge parameter dependence cancels, and this kind of pleasing when you go through this sort of calculation, and it actually all works in terms of what how it should work out. So you also have to do things like this. You have to in, you have basically do one loop corrections all over the place, including input parameters. Things like the bed, you have to worry about what's the definition of the bed, including loop corrections. So this is the tadpole story. The one loop tadpole story is also present. You basically need to define the, the, the bed, including these loop corrections. And you also need to basically have finite renormalization effects for the external states, things like the Higgs, things like the photon, and things like the electric charge. You also have to do all those one loop contributions as well, because they appear in the LC formula, to then address the amplitude to get something which is essentially an S matrix output. Okay, so that's a lot of work, essentially, but it's all systematically calculable, doable. You need things like this, the two-point function for the Higgs. And you also need the basically the photon normalization or the electric charge normalization. So these, in principle, you think are independent, but I'm doing something called the background field method here, which I want to talk about a little bit as I go forward, which basically relates these two. This is an example of the simplifications that happen in the background field method, which is uh, essentially that so you calculate one of these and you get the other one. This is just the two-point function of the Higgs, which you have to calculate in the EFD. And it's just these diagrams. Quite straightforward, but it's just work. Essentially, you just have to do a lot of diagrams. But what about this sort of relationship? Let's go back to that. That relationship is great because if it's true, this sort of thing cancels, which makes life much easier. And then you just need that two point function for the Higgs for Higgs to gamma gamma. So it actually follows from a word name when you're using the background field method. So that's something that's kind of neat. Then you want the word identities. And you want the background field method to do these sort of simplifications in these calculations to make your life easier. And also, it helps you check your calculations because it gets a bit complicated with all these Wilson coefficients, what's going on. And you'd like things like this around about knowing how the calculation should work if you actually check to see if it actually works out that way. It's a good calculational check for you to execute these things. This is all building up to the geometric stuff that was kind of making this not quite work as expected. So, here's what you get just for the leading sort of calculation we did many years ago. You essentially have an amplitude compared to the normal amplitude, which goes this way. This is the tree level Wilson coefficient, which is this combination, which you do as counter term matrix. That counter term matrix told you to write down the diagrams I showed you before, and that gave you all of this stuff in finite terms when you did the full calculation after the vertices canceled. 
And these are the kind of finite uh, term wave function normalization of the Higgs and definition of the, the, the bed in the tactical of one loop effects. So that's basically what comes out of the calculation at the end of the day using the background field method. And these are just some integral forms that are present in the theory. Straightforward. What's here? This is fixed by normalization conditions. This is the not so big log we emphasized at the start. The logs aren't that big. If you look at this formula and convince yourself, are these logs much bigger than the other finite terms? They're not that much bigger. And these guys are just about as big. And then you have this thing, which probably confuses uh, you if you had some like, bias of a certain form of second model calculations. Uh, you get pure finite terms. So you basically get some Wilson coefficient dependence not necessarily associated with the log and not something you would necessarily expect, but just looking at the RD itself, which just like finite diagrams can just exist and just give you this coefficient, but it might be a bit surprising to you that that also happens. It doesn't have a log, but it can be there and it's there. So if you look at the numbers, this pure finite term exists. In addition, you can just basically look at the sort of ratios that you get. Are the finite terms small compared to the log terms? And essentially they're not. Which I told you before, you can just look at the numbers themselves. And so that's why it's really important, which is that the RG is not a good proxy for the full one loop contribution to the theory. I said this before in words, but you just look at this calculation and convince yourself it's not a good proxy. So we have to do the full one loop calculation. Good. Now, here's the thing that's interesting, at least to me. So this is what's kind of shocked me when I was doing this calculation. So we we're using the background field method and it had those cancellations that I was telling you about built in, and those cancellations were working to a degree. But then this part of the Lagrangian existed. Sorry, I write it out in detail, but I just want to give you a little bit of detail so you can look at the paper. So you basically expand, and there's a whole bunch of stuff associated with the bed that happens in terms of contact terms that you get. And that stuff associated with the bed gives you sort of diagrams like this. And those diagrams were a bit confusing because when you actually look at their divergence structure, they had divergences that you didn't anticipate from the RGE. Uh, which are just present in the theory. So that kind of threw us for a little while. But what happens is essentially the ghosts come in to cancel off those diagrams. And then you might say to yourself, wait a minute, ghosts proportional to higher dimensional operators, how does that happen? Because I don't write this down when I write down a higher dimensional operator, I usually write it down in a manner which should just write down the Lagrangian in terms of the dynamical fields and not the ghost. So where does that come from? Well, it, if you think a little more about it, it's kind of straightforward. It comes from the gauge fixing term. All right, you write down a gauge fixing term involving the higher dimensional operators, and then you'll basically source ghosts from the gauge fixing term, and then you know that these diagrams come about. And by doing this consistently and following it through with the background field method gauge fixing, you do cancel off these unusual divergences. Okay, so the divergences are under control. However, this is weird, and this really bothered me when I first found it years ago. All the divergences cancel. These contact operators, if you look at what's happening with the usual way to write down the background field method gauge fixing, where if you have basically two C parameters in the gauge fixing term you write down, you just write down the gauge fixing term in the background field method in the standard model, do the calculation. And then this happens where, so there's there's actually some, there's an accident essentially that Toft built into the background field method and using RC gauge. So Toft plus others built in. And that accident is if you use RC gauge and use one C parameter, uh, and use the background field method. Actually, you don't have to use the background field method for this particular part of it, but this basically cancels. This sort of contact term can be removed, and it's definitely removed in the background field method even at one loop. You don't have to fix it by our normalization condition. Now, you use the background field method in this calculation, these divergences cancel, but nonetheless, this sort of piece is around. And in addition, this sort of piece of proportional v squared is around. So you can't choose these C parameters in some way to basically cancel off this local contact term. Which was confusing proportional to the bed because this is telling you there's like kinetic mixing between the photon and the z. And essentially, the background field method is designed for that not to be there. If you want to have external states which are well defined states, and so you understand how to think about them, then you don't have to use normalization conditions to fix away these sorts of mixings. But they're induced in this case. And that was confusing. I didn't like that. So that's the problem. I said it again. <laughs> to me, extremely confusing. Because the whole point is back up and just remove that stuff. And then it's there. So this threw me for a loop, and I stopped doing loop calculations for a little while. So what's going on here? You notice it's associated with the bet fundamentally. And look at the operator it's associated with in this case. So has to do with redefining the photon and the z field. So this was a mystery to me. So the mystery has been solved, and it was another clue to our sinking geometrically. So let me show you how we solve that. 
So first of all, just to remind you of the background field method so you understand the intuition I keep expressing as to the photon and the Z should be something in terms of the background fields, which you don't have to fix away such contact terms by normalization conditions. So what the background field method is, when you actually do calculation with quantum field theory, you basically have to fix the gauge to do the calculation. So it's usually a bit of a mess because you fix the gauge, the gauge fixing breaks the symmetry that you want there in the answer. And then you do the calculation and then when you combine up all the terms in the end, you find that the symmetry is restored in the amplitude, the relationships between the amplitudes, but there's only this slap knot Taylor identities in terms of intermediate steps of the calculation. So there's, it's a well-defined formalism, you know, in the standard model, you can apply it to the standard model of T, but a better way to calculate, in my view, at least in one loop, is something called the background field method. This is a nice review by Abbott. And essentially what you do there is you double the fields. You take your fields and you say to yourself, I want to preserve the background fields having the gauge symmetry, and I want to only gauge fix the quantum fields that have to be gauge fixed to do the calculation. So the background field has a hat, the quantum field is, a, is just a, is a, just split off from this guy. You gauge fix this guy in a way, and you choose your gauge fix condition so you preserve the background gauge symmetry. And that's nice because then intermediate steps of your calculation has the gauge symmetry manifestly preserved. And that is still true when you start choosing C parameters for the quantum fields. So you can choose those to your advantage, and you still have the gauge symmetry guidance around in terms of how things should be related. Okay, so it's just a really good way to calculate, in my view, at least at one loop for derivative calculation. Now, it was known for many years that the gauge fixing term of this form for the electroweak standard model, the background field method is given here, and this is what we use in the HD gamma gamma calculation. This is something that comes from Einhorn and a whole bunch of other collaborators that basically developed this many years before we were taught. And you notice there's hat fields here with the background Higgs field, and then quantum Higgs field, and there's like one XC parameter, and it's just a gauge fixing term fixing the W and the V. This, if you just choose this equal to this, gives you the sort of standard uh, gauge fixing term that you're used to in terms of the mass eigenstate state fields. And when you make this choice, that's exactly what I was showing on the former slides, also cancels off those contact terms and makes things even easier. And that was built into the background field method, but it fails now in this map. So the problem was that there's something weird going on associated with the bed and the, the definitions of the fields uh, that, the, the, that was just appearing when you're using the usual background field technology and it wasn't giving you the answer structure that you expected. So the solution, and you probably noticed this is the mantra for like the last couple of days, is always just think about it geometrically. And this is actually one of the things that really started convincing me that geom geometry is, is the right way to go, this paper with Andreas Selsit and another collaborator uh, from many years ago. Because I basically, Andreas came in as a PhD student and I gave him this challenge saying, look, this weird thing is happening and somehow it's got to be related to geometry and with one XC parameter, we should be able to write down a, a gauge fixing term which fixes this problem. So let's try and figure out how to do that. And the way you do that is essentially you do the simplest, stupidest thing, which is usually the best physics, right? Gauge fixing before was just an explicit square of the gauge fixing term that I showed you on the previous slide. And if you're using background field geometry, if you want to think about it conceptually, you want to gauge fix on the background Higgs manifold. So you take explicit squares involving fields and you generalize them to contacting them, connecting them through the background Higgs manifold with the index contractions. So you put in the metric that does that. And you also put in the metric, which basically gives you a connection for the scalar fields. And this is just to, to by pulling apart things which are naive squares in the formula that I showed you before. And this would be putting in the metric where it has to be to contract the indices correctly. It's really nothing more than that, but it's conceptually taking the gauge fixing in flat space, flat field space, and promoting it to gauge fixing in curved field space with two metrics sort of. Then you just use the usual gauge fixing procedure, and everything is nice. And you basically introduce the metrics, which you've seen over time. You introduce this guy for those dimension six operators. And it appears here. You introduce this metric. For these dimension six operators, and it appears there. And we're essentially using here this, if you want to look at the technical details in the papers, but there's also a real field representation. Ken Minim was mentioning this the other day. It makes this sort of calculation easier to use the real fields for the scalars, just technical note. But that's how the, the metrics appear, dictated by just the symmetry structure contracting this is correctly. And this is the dimension six result, is what we need in terms of just fixing up the gamma gamma calculation. And it works. It kills exactly the problem. Okay, so that's nice. It basically restores how the get background field method was supposed to work, cleaning up the calculation more cleanly using this background field gauge fixing through the geometry. So this is a very strong hint to me 
this is the way to think in terms of this theory when the higher dimensional operators run. You can think of this conceptually as your background field gauge fixing, uh, including the non-perturbative corrections, redefining the gauge fields, which are present due to the Higgs manifolds being around. Okay. So I think we need to gauge fix geometrically. Now remember, the loop corrections are related to the dimension eight corrections. They were not independent. They were cross-correlated. So this means you should think geometrically for loop calculations, if you want to do it this way. And you should also think geometrically for dimension eight calculations. But wonderfully, the GSMF is exactly the theoretical framework that basically does the geometry in both cases for you consistently. So that's why it's kind of the way to go. Okay, so here's something really cool. So using those results uh, with uh, another postdoc of mine, Tyler Corbett, Andreas Yen, and myself, we were able to basically take the variation with respect to the background field gauge transformation on the effective action. And one nice thing about the background field method is this is zero, right? Because you preserve the symmetry. So you don't get any gauge transformation in the background fields. Manifestly, it's zero. From there, you actually get these expressions. Again, this is this real field representation generator. These are the five that things, the ones that things field in the real field representation. And this is your, grant, your answer, essentially expanding out from the background field. And then you take variations of this, and you get all of your word identities. Okay, so the photon word identities are trivial. It's still transfers, and everything's fine. And it should work at one loop, and it does. But here's something super cool. Okay, so here's another clue. So you do this, and you look at the z-identities, look at this two-point function in its relationship to this two-point function. So one really thing that's really nice about the background field method word identities in the standard model without any higher dimensional operators is this, which is a simple word identity relationship, basically appears with the z-mass, that's the standard model z-mass, and it's also something that appears with like the loop correct the standard model z-mass. So even in the standard model, you do the background field method, the word identities have like a nice structure. They basically make sense to you. And the Z, actual physical Z mass appears there. What appears here in this approach with all these geometric field space connections around is exactly, with this part, it's exactly the Z mass redefined with the higher dimensional operators. So everything consistently combines up in a really nice way in analogy to the standard model case, so that you not only get the loop corrections working as you expect, you expect the higher dimensional operator corrections appearing here to work the same sort of way. It's a really beautiful thing. And another hint this is the way of things, it's geometric. And then also you get these terms, which you have to worry about for some technical reasons, which I don't want to get into. So you, when you see something like that, it's really cool, right? And it works at tree level, but you should always check at one loop. I mean, you know it's going to work, but you should always actually do the hard work and check at one loop. So we've done that check as well. And you can see that that sort of relationship is working. It's really kind of nice to see how all the Wilson coefficient kind of works in this way to combine up to preserve this expectation. Again, one of the benefits of doing the gauge fixing this way and calculating this way is it gives you lots of checks of your calculations so you know you're doing it right. This map gets a bit complicated, so the more checks are better in terms of figuring out what's going on. This geometric mass appears with a particular Wilson coefficient. Shifting the definition of the z, we'll get to this tomorrow in great detail. You also have to do like the two-point function, so that's two-point function of the standard model with the shift in the definition of the z mass Wilson coefficient dependence. And then you do the exact uh, two-point function for the z to this uh, Olson field, uh, higher dimensional operator dependence on that Wilson coefficient. Now this one is a whole set of diagrams involving redefined Feynman rules and explicit insertions of operators and gauge couplings and everything you can redefine. So it's like a huge number of things that are being subsumed into this answer. And just doing the divergence part, I did this with Tyler. He developed the code to do this, and then I basically did it by hand to check. This piece and this piece combine up in a way that has to, because we're going to be satisfied with the divergence structure, exactly cancel this Wilson coefficient by Wilson coefficient. So we check all the Wilson coefficients, diverse structure of one loop for the two-point function and entities. And it indeed works exactly as expected. Tyler's code is, is also out there as something you can use if you want to start to use that code to push it in the direction of doing one loop calculations automatically. It's a work in progress, but it's, it's, it's all the checks are working. So hopefully that's clear. Are there any questions at this stage? Some technical details. But, okay. So the current state of the art is fall. We can calculate things like this now. Now let me walk you through this a little bit because it gets to be like a big giant formula. Here's again, 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 my obsession in the two of the parameter schemes. So you saw a version of this, which was just the tree level, linear interference part with the part with the one loop result standard model. That was just this term, because this F1 is this combination of Wilson coefficients that is there at tree level. 
You can notice if you compare between the two different primary schemes, they're quite similar in terms of the numerical values of the stuff that's calculable multiplying the Wilson coefficient dependence. And what is here is not just the tree level dimension six result, it's also the dimension eight result and the one loop result and all the cross terms, all the things I told you at the start we needed to get. Okay, so we can have that everything and have a full formula like this in terms of the form I told you at the start, we need to get all of these pieces. We actually can do that now. So this is how they basically align. So you take this example, and this is the linear interference piece and the one loop interference piece. That's the linear interference piece up there for dimension six. This is like the one loop version of it, also involving the input parameter redefinitions. This piece, the square piece, in terms of the cross terms, double insertions of operators, and also the direct square, is this yellow. And then this piece is the pure dimension eight piece, if you're in the standard model, which we also can calculate with the GSMF. Okay, so all these pieces you can calculate now, and for some observables at least. And remember, I emphasized the point that these coefficients are not all independent, right? So you need to basically have this formula and have it be consistent between loop corrections and dimension eight corrections. But that's basically the state of the art, what we can do now as of the summer. And there's a lot of debate, and I kind of, at dinner last night, started to complain about this, but some people think that essentially you should only keep things like this term and this term, <laughs> and forget about all these other terms. Uh, and you can decide for yourself if that's a good idea or not, or if we should just do the actual full calculation. And I think it's pretty obvious we should just do the full calculation if we can. So it's not a good approximation just keeping those terms for the dimension eight, dimension six squared effects. It's like, it's obvious. Okay, so let me emphasize again, just finishing up a couple of the checks that were built into this, which are kind of beautiful and took many, many years for these checks to kind of work themselves out, but everything worked as expected with all the geometric stuff underlying how this stuff fit together. So the background field method, I told you, it's really nice because it gives you nice word identities and it has structure that makes sense geometrically. It also lets you cross-check many things. And I showed you one of the diversions, cancellation, and cross-checks. It basically gives you something else which is really nice, which I, in my opinion is underemphasized in the literature. I don't know why people don't make a bigger deal out of this. The one loop redefinition input parameters is something that's a challenge, right? So you always have to do, remember I said, the input redefinitions of one loop as well as the actual process, the stuff that was kind of like this yellow for the ZDK case. Those are all individually gauge independent if you use the background field method, and that's really nice. So that's another check at an intermediate stage of the calculation that follows through. And I don't know why this is not emphasized in the literature, but this is the case. And it also lets you, uh, using the background field method, interfacing with this really nice calculation of Sofer and Nankins, which did the matching down to lower energy scales from between the SMEF and the lower energy one way you integrate out the Higgs, and the W, and that sort of thing. We were able to cross check our results with their results, and they also use the background field method, and we get exact agreement. And you can also get that this finite term of this relationship expected in the background field method is exactly satisfied by two independent groups completely independently calculating, and it works exactly as expected. So all sorts of calculational checks are provided and it just, it's just working. Very nice. This is the result here. So there's something that was really kind of nice to see basically flesh out after about six or seven years. So when we did this initial calculation, we noticed that there's a very big effect in sort of the tadpole effects on the bed. The top part depends here because you know, the top part's pretty big, is something kind of huge in the perturbative calculation. And you might, and it's like really, it's kind of like it's disturbingly big. You might have to worry about essentially that sort of correction. But what we thought and we said should happen is essentially that should be canceled from when you do inputs and outputs because there'll be a consistent way that this appears in the input measurements and in the actual, in the actual result. Consistently, basically, the tadpole effect should cancel out. This is the expectation. This is the tadpole effect. And then we have the explicit calculation that we can check. Many years later, combining up the low energy extraction with the actual things to gamma gamma calculation we did, we find the exact cancellation as it should be of those classical terms as well. So another check, which is really nice. There's other structure of the theory, which is universal, which is kind of nice, which you see. So Higgs to gamma gamma, we did a combined calculation of Higgs to gamma gamma with Higgs to blue blue Higgs, blue blue Higgs production. And in both cases, with these gauge fields, there is a nice combination, which is also gauge independent, which is a nice structure of the calculation that shows up as a further cross check. And essentially, you have to combine with this VEV correction 
in the heat wave function normalization and the explicitly C dependence that appears in these diagrams with these guys explicitly there. And this is also something which is gauge parameter dependent, which it has to be because all the other input parameters are individually gauge parameter dependent. So to factorize the calculation in a really nice way, we have so many checks in terms of how the calculation should work to basically figure out if you're making a mistake. And it worked here as well. And I should emphasize this also helps you with dimension eight if you start to do this calculation as well. So that's it. I wanted to basically try and walk you through a calculation of this form and give you some of the details on it. Uh, and that might have been a little overwhelming in terms of technical details, but this is the chance in which you can ask, ask about those technical details and we can actually go with some more further discussion on that if you want um, to finish up. Mm -hmm. Technical questions? Sometimes you just have to calculate. In your, in your earlier slide, you mentioned the L EFT. Yeah. And uh, is it Higgs EFT or no, it's something different. else? So it's integrate out Higgs too. Yeah, it's a low energy effective theory. Let me go back to this. So maybe I should just okay. Where is this? Here. This is map is essentially the standard model Lagrangian plus the dimension six operators, dimension eight operators, and it's useful for the scales where there's dynamical Ws, dynamical Zs, dynamical Higgses, up to like TV scale, QTV scale, uh, cutoff scales associated with these higher dimensional operators. That's this region. The left, and that's a pun by the way, it's called the left because it's what's left over when you integrate other things, or it's something called the wet, which is not, a, I mean, I know that's a good pun too, but I think the left is kind of fun. Uh, is what's left over when you integrate out here, the top part, the Higgs, and the W, and the Z. And then you basically have electromagnetism and a bunch of fermion fields around with some higher dimensional operators. So that's a theory that you use to basically interface with meson making experiments, other low energy measurements, and you need to normalize that theory as well. You need to do the one loop matching between this theory and that theory, in order to do the BEV cancellation checks that I was telling you about, that was done as well, the full one loop result. So it's just this error, this theory for down here, essentially. And it's not the heft. The heft is a different theory for describing this sort of dynamics. Yeah. So they did both matchings, just FYI. Yep. Yeah. They relate this to. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you think do you think we will be following uh, for example the uh, uh, dimension ten or higher operator? So uh, as I tried to emphasize in the earlier lectures, you should always use symmetry to guide yourself. Um, and when you think about dimension eight operators compared to dimension six operators. There's two questions you can ask yourself. Does something different happen at dimension eight compared to dimension six? And you can know, ask the same question. Does something different happen at dimension 10 compared to dimension eight compared to dimension six? That difference can be either kinematics. Does it do something with kinematic phase-based populations that doesn't happen at lower operator forms, lower mass dimension operators? Or it can be a symmetry effect, which can first come in in the operators at high order. So when it comes to kinematics, I'll show you with the GSMF stuff, we've been able to understand that essentially when you need for low endpoint functions to build up formulas, the anomalous kinematics pretty much get saturated when you go to dimension eight. You don't really need to go to dimension 10. There's one example I'll show you tomorrow where there's a dimension 10 result that comes in, but it doesn't have different kinematics, just like a different index structure in terms of operator form. But what's more interesting is that it is true that when you go to these higher mass dimension operators and you start thinking about flavor symmetry breaking and like variant number violation and sort of these sorts of effects, um, then sometimes you want to think about those high mass dimension operators for symmetry violating reasons, but not for LAC measurements, but like low energy measurements and variant number violation, that sort of thing. So there are there is reasons to go to higher mass dimension operators, but only basically symmetry. It's not really kinematics. It's kind of an interesting fact that kinematics is not arbitrarily complicated in terms of these higher dimensional operators for, for the measurements that we can make essentially precisely for these colliders that you would have thought, oh, doesn't it get arbitrarily complicated? Doesn't it like any phase space will happen as you go up in mass dimension? 
And the thing is, more complicated face spaces, different face spaces compared to conceptually, you can understand the following. More complicated face spaces would require essentially more derivatives, right? More derivatives compared to lower mass dimension operators. You might think, well, that's going to lead to arbitrary face space complications. But more derivatives, you remember equation of motion effects can always be like derivatives acting on fields reduced out in terms of other field connections. So those derivative extra structures you can write down, essentially, they all get damped out with the equation of motion effects. So There's not arbitrarily complicated kinematics for low mass dimension for, for higher mass dimension operators. It's a way of conceptually understanding. They get traded for you know high multiplicity external states with lots and lots of fields. And then basically there's some phase space suppressed that they don't do much for you. Other questions? Yeah. <coughs> Um, in my case, uh, this is very my question because I don't know Smith uh, well. Um, um, when any exotic signal was measured, uh, if we can explain the exotic signal by using SNAP, mm -hmm. then by finding the fundamental theory is another block. Or is it wrong when we explain the uh, exotic signal by using SNAPs? So um, there's an assumption in your in your question, which was single, which was singular, which was signal, right? So what I'm trying to emphasize uh, is that it's always patterns of measurements for Lagrangians that are actually meaningful in terms of the theory breaking down. Any one measurement just fixes some parameters in the theory. And if you think of that as like something that is deviating from the expectation or not, what you have in your mind is that there's a whole set of other measurements which fixed your prediction compared to something deviated from your expectation like the WMAX. Uh, so the utility of SMAT is multiple, but one of the things that it makes clear with just breaking down the operators and how they appear in all the input measurements making any particular prediction is how the same physics effect through its particular Wilson coefficient and combination Wilson coefficients appears in multiple places. So it's more informative, and that should also happen in the UV model, right? So if you take the UV model, it might not be obvious that you'll have these correlated effects for inputs and all these outputs. You write down the thing with all the UV dynamics and you just do all these loop calculations, which is kind of hard. Um, and then you, or even tree level calculations, well, in the hard dimension, or probably the extra gauge fields around whatever you have in your model. And the pattern will still be there in the UV model as well. But the, I think that it's, it's informative that the EFT basically aligns your thinking with how these combinations of effects have to appear in multiple measurements, and it kind of guides you to think consistently just using the Wilson coefficients in terms of when there's a deviation here. You can look at it and say, well, where, where does this Wilson coefficient dependence also appear? And it's like, well, it's also over here. And it's like, well, okay, but it has other Wilson coefficients, so maybe there has to be a cancellation if we're not seeing a deviation over there, but it really guides your thinking very efficiently uh, compared to the UV model because, I mean, you can do the same thing in a UV model, but I just think it's way more efficient to, to tailor expand at the start uh, and just see the guidance in terms of the formula that's written down. And then the great thing about EFT as well is that is that independent of the UV model, look at all the stuff we can calculate, right? I mean, all those formulas are true, and we can just do that calculation before the deviation get ready and before we have guessed the right UV model. And it's always going to be useful, no matter what UV model it is, because the Taylor expansion for the low energy measurements is always going to be true. So all of those results, you know, they're still useful. So this is something I tell my students, and 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 I usually tell them when they when they come in. This is like a mantra I have. So, so I tell them, look, if you like models, you can work on models. And I've worked on models for many years. And the problem with working on models, this is a very biased point of view. Let me just cut. Is that you're always going to be excited about whatever model you're working on at the moment. Otherwise, you wouldn't work on it. So you're going to be excited about something, but over time, what you'll notice if you pay attention is you're going to be excited about something in a time-limited fashion. So there's going to be an anomaly, you're going to work on one model, there's going to be something you think is interesting, and there's going to be another model, you're going to work on that in time. And you're always going to be excited about the model you're working on at any particular time, but that model will change over time as <laughs> to so what's interesting. And so, so if, you're, if that's something that you want to do and you find interesting, that's fine. I've gone through that phase myself. But what I tell students is that the great thing about EFT is that you can do calculations where you won't look back 10 years from now and think, well, I was really excited about that at the time, but why wasn't I working on this? This is way more exciting. 
right? Because you'll do calculations and the calculations will never be wrong. So they'll still be useful. So if you do work that is in the not wrong zone, that always sticks around, that's pretty good, right? Because then it's always cumulative and you never have to regret it. Whereas sometimes models, uh, you look back and it's like, a, it's like a night of drinking. You know, you look back and it's like, maybe I shouldn't have gone there. Even at the time, it seemed like a good idea, but you know, that's my personal point of view on models. So I think the EFT is great because it, it's not wrong. Can I ask a question? Uh oh, the model builders got upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have some technical questions. Sure, technical. So good. in page 28, okay, cool. get a fixing pump. Right. And uh, I think the, there are two pumps, which one of the first pump is page 28. I'm getting there. This one? Yeah, it's the first pump. The last this one? Yeah, yes. The last equation. This one. The first equation, my first pump does not depend on the higher dimensional first pump. Right. And the second pump does it. Yes, does it. Does that's right. It. Yeah. So we, we understand, even the, in the standard model, do you think the first pump is this? Oh, so this is what I was trying to say. Maybe I didn't say it correctly. So in the standard model alone, mm. If you choose these two C parameters to be equal to one another, you kill this off. And that's usually what the usual gauge fixing story does for you, which is kind of underneath our feet when you do these set of calculations. And so one of the things I first tried to do when I met this problem is like, well, maybe we should basically relate this parameter to this parameter. So the short answer to your question is no. But then what's weird about it for both of these is that there's no consistent choice of these, right? So if you basically try and choose so there's a whole unpublished paper trying to fix this problem another way before geometry. So let me just tell you what went wrong there. If you try and fix this problem by basically relating this to this with a higher dimensional operator correction, which you might think, well, that's what you should do. Then you can try and cancel this off. And you can construct things, but then it gets really hella complicated really bad. <laughs> just in goldstones and all sorts of things have weird operator dependence. It gets, it gets incredibly confusing as to how to think about things. But this goes away with an exceed choice, but there's no exceed choice independent that, that lets you cancel out both of these, right? So when you choose these to be equal, this guy sticks around is the point. So if you I think the, the first I mean these two terms are uh, I think just take the same form uh, in terms of this derivative and uh, mm -hmm. can you choose the over I mean it's a combination of these two terms together. Well that's what I was just saying. The short answer is you can try that. And then try that first, mm -hmm. and then at least other technical complications of how you shift essentially mm -hmm. uh, how you redefine propagators and that sort of things. Uh, so I, I can show you my notes on that, but I think that is not a good fruitful path to go down. And the right solution to this is essentially to just to introduce mm -hmm. the gauge fixing on the background manifolds, and that exactly cancels this okay. problem off. So the other question is the I think I like the geometry. We should, okay, that's right. So, <laughs> so you, in your maybe solution to this problem, mm -hmm. you propose the kind of uh, geometry, yeah. geometry of the American. I mean, what's that? The, the case I thought you want. Yeah. So now you have a uh, gauge fix, fixing term, which depends mm -hmm. on the metric. Yep. G and A, B, and also you have a uh, metric for the scalar manifold. Yes, that's right. And uh, my question is the uh, when you introduce the uh, ghost to oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, the ghost Lagrangian comes about in the same way with the kind of pop up procedure. You just do the variation, and the ghost Lagrangian comes in the same way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you have a ghost Lagrangian, the ghost does not uh, the kinetic term, mm -hmm. so the ghost to field depends on the field matrix in the so higher dimensional field. operators. That's right. But that, that's exactly correct. Uh, but that's also what I was saying before, which we kind of found by root force, right? Just by doing the dimension six operator part, we were already able to see that if you took a gauge fixing term and did the variation, then you would get a higher dimensional operator sourcing dose already. So that was kind of like, our, we already knew that had to be in the game to cancel off some effects. Mm -hmm. It's just the other stuff was still around, which was still confusing, mm -hmm. right? So that, so that is the case. It, 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 so the most, then, uh, you still have to really redefine the ghost field mm -hmm. in order to, to be uh, to make it uh, transparently normalized. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you, yeah, it yeah. doesn't yes. coincide the basis, the rotation of mm -hmm. the ghost field doesn't 
if it uh, coincides with the rotation for the gaze field, for example, and the gaze field yeah. needs to rotate. Yeah, that's right. right. That's correct. So I can I can show you. I know I think I know what you're worried about. There's no real problem that appears there, but you do need to actually take into account the goes to the garage consistently in terms of these effects as well. And uh, <coughs> it's explicitly written down in both uh, the paper we wrote. Is it here? You can just see explicitly how the form is. Uh, here, if you look, I think it's like one of our, I think it's our last equation, it's the ghost creation term. And also, if you want to see more details on how that rotation happens in the mass eigenstate fields, mm -hmm. uh, where's Peter's name? Peter wrote a nice description on it. Um, sorry, I'll give you the reference over here. It's all that, yeah. I'll find it easily. Okay, I'll go in the other direction. It's over here. It's sort of cross check stuff. Got there. Here, if you look at this paper as well, you'll find the mass eigenstates with the ghosts and everything written out in a bit more detail. But here's a word of warning their ghost convention and our ghost convention has a minus sign difference, even though it's fine in terms of the actual calculation at the end of the day. So be careful comparing the two results because there's actually a minus sign convention choice difference that was made there. But you can look at the details here. Uh, and then you compare it to our, our final result, you'll see it's the same. Do you, you have the final result? What was the final result? Mm -hmm. So you have the six operators, including ghosts and yes. other things? Yes, that's Tyler's package. That's right. So if you want to get that, you should go back here. This paper, Tyler wrote this package. <laughs> and uh, this one has, this was us doing it together. But he wrote the code. I just do these, I mean, I, I kind of do things by hand. I don't know. But he wrote the code to do this. And that code also has those corrections as the final rules. It's a UFO. You have to interpret a UFO, um, but it is there. Yeah. We didn't explicitly write it out in LaTeX. It's kind of, you know, you just do it, but it's not that exciting. Yeah. Any other questions? Or questions from the participant on Zoom? So, participant on Zoom ever asked a question? Do they exist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have uh, one uh, short oh, one here. Maybe first, and then yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, uh, this is not related to the time, not to the case, as uh, much as the case, but uh, but the very few missiles can operate for the, into the higher dimension that operator, including the not only the field. Uh, Fit having the quantum number of the gauge fit, but also the singlet fit also include the singlet fit of the gauge symmetry is included. In this case, the background fit method is still useful. Uh, which, which, which results are? Ah, uh, if you, the higher dimensional operator includes the singlet fit. Like like a different like a like not the standard model EFT but like a different theory which has another singlet around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, which which result are you asking about? Like the geometric gauge fixing, or or what are you asking about in terms of the result? Because it's of course a different theory. You have to calculate in that theory. What I would say is, are you asking a specific result to, or just the general approach? Maybe I'm mean, sorry, general uh general number uh you you use the uh, background field with uh yep. symmetry of the other gauge symmetry. Right. Yeah, and the quantum field is the other gauge fixing. But this is also the background field method. Yeah, so yeah. so the background field method <laughs> you can use as a gauge fixing procedure and as a calculational procedure for any field theory. It's fine to do for any field theory. You just do this kind of generalization where you take a field and you split it into a classical background field, and then you have the also the quantum fluctuating field. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have the standard model Higgs and some other singlet field around or a scalar field around, you can still do this procedure. You'll have to decide what your classical background fields are. So there'll be there'll be some subtleties there in terms of there's going to be some mixing effects you'll have to worry about and think about in terms of what your field basis is. But um, there, it, it's, it's, it is calculable, uh, and it is something that you can just systematically set up with these techniques. There's nothing about the background field method that's limited to one scalar field. If that's what your question is, it's a general approach. I don't, I don't know of examples in the literature of people calculating with multiple scalar fields in the background field method, but I would think the two Higgs doublet model people probably did at some point at the one loop level. I could find, we could look to see if there's examples. 
So in, maybe in the case of singlet, uh, it's a flavor in the candle. Say again? Yeah. In the case of singlet, the, the field theory method would be modified <coughs> universally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, but you have to choose your field basis. Yeah. yeah, that's another way of saying it. Yeah, that's right. You need to choose some background field structure that you're actually. You, so you always need to calculate. Well, you know this from Higgs inflation, right? So you always need to calculate with some background field configuration, which usually that is a statement of only one field, but it's really a general statement, right? You always have to have some classical background field set that you are scattering around and doing your perturbations around. So you need to choose a background field configuration for sure. If there's multiple scalar fields, that's still doable. It's possible. You just need to choose a convention to your calculation. You just over uh, normalization could be changed in the presence of single field because oh, for sure, it's yeah. universal. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to be careful about it. And, uh, if, yeah, I think it might be important if the single uh, gets bad. Yes, that's right. Like yeah, that's what I was saying. You'll have to choose your field basis. There'll be mixing effects, then you'll have to be careful about that. Absolutely. Did you, you had a question? You went over to the question. Yeah, yeah. you need to go to work. This is the last lecture. Mm -hmm. So, SNAP, there are a lot of work that has been done by many people, including you. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, what's next? And what's ah. the challenge again? What's the future perspective for students who are studying you know, in the field? So, that's what tomorrow is supposed to be about. Okay. So, I think going forward, I've tried to convince you that efficiently we need to. So, there's multiple things that are going on which have a lot of work to do. So one thing that, that is going on that is a lot of work is just people just like basically taking the technology we talked about the last couple of days today and the geometric stuff and just like doing the simulations, like just getting all the observables with like the actual Wilson coefficients there and you know just to mention six stuff being done correctly with all the all the stuff there. There's like a lot of work in terms of and optimizing cuts to have dependencies on operators. There's just a lot of very straightforward work to do with dimension six alone. Tons of that is going to be done for many, many years. Uh, more interesting to me, at least, is the need to go for the most precise measurements beyond leading order. So something I didn't really say explicitly, but was kind of implicit in what I was talking about, is of course you're interested in the higher the next leading order corrections in the SMEF for the most precise processes. Things like Higgs to gamma gamma are going to be very precise experimentally. Google Higgs is something they have like enormous data sets on. So, so of course, on all of the very precise processes that are actually going to get experimentally precise and are theoretically under control, we want to not just go to leading order, we want to go to next to leading order. And uh, to do that, I think doing the geometric approach is what's efficient. And I'll lay out an algorithm tomorrow that I've already put in the literature as to how we do that process by process, which is basically underlying the, the calculation that we did. So that is stuff that needs to be done for many processes. And then there's also sorts of formal questions that need to be done in terms of field space geometry as well, which is interesting going forward, which is if people are more formally interested, that sort of thing that, that basically there's a lot of work to do there. Okay, so this is great. So this is a good advertisement for the talk tomorrow then. Yeah, hopefully okay. people will be interested. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Professor for the game. And we, we continue at 1.30. Yeah.